Yo, what's up, everybody? On this episode of the Bullpen Podcast, listen to me and my good friend, Nate Thomas, talk about all sorts of things. We're going to get into the relationship between the stock market and crypto, how we believe blockchain is going to change the world, if Google is really evil, spectrum bands such as 5G, smart cities over in Japan, and AI. Let's do it. All right. One more thing before we get to the podcast. In this podcast, The Crypto Bully, any co-host and his guests do not give financial or investment advice and encourage you to do your own research on all topics mentioned. Do not invest into this market what you can't afford to lose. I bet I know what you're thinking. Is this really Morgan Freeman? Well, unfortunately not. But Lyndon thought it would be a good idea to use such a soothing voice for the legal mumbo-jumbo to smooth things over. Now, let's do it. Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Play ball! the bullpen podcast number nine the crypto bully wow (laughs) he makes it look so easy and that ball has left the stadium hey what's up everybody i want to welcome everyone to the 10th episode of the bullpen podcast i am your host the crypto bully also known as Mr. Crypto Carlton. And here on this podcast, I like to get into the bullpen with some of the most interesting and influential individuals in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space to pick their brains about their opinions and see what they have going on. So today, we have a real interesting individual coming onto the show today. Actually, a good friend of mine, knew him since high school, so known him for a long time now. This guy is an extremely knowledgeable individual. He's a day trader. He's a market analyst technical analyst, and he's done private wealth management as well. So without further ado, I go ahead and introduce Mr. Nate Thomas. Thank you so much, Lennon. It's great to see you again, man. I know it's been, what, more than 12 years since we were walking the streets of uh, our high school wondering what we're going to do with ourselves if we were going to go to college and be like everybody else or if we were going to grab life by the horns and uh, see where it took us. And I guess we grab life in this bull market we're in. (laughs) <laughs> um, a little bit of my uh, background history, I guess. Yeah, I've, I've been a day trader. I've done fund management. I've built my own hedge fund. I've done equity indexes for private individuals, all by accident, actually, because I was just introduced to the market about eight or nine years ago. And the first question I ever got was, do you know how to invest in the stock market? And I told the individual, I don't gamble. Little <laughs> did I know. <laughs> what this world actually has to do with when it comes to the market and gambling as a whole. So right. that's kind of a little bit background of, of how I got into this area that we're in today, which is ever changing, ever changing. That's what's up, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is forever changing, man. It has become so interesting. And even us, you know, we hadn't, like you said, we hadn't talked in a, in a long while. And then through Facebook, we reconnected again. And, you know, we kind of started the, the topic of crypto. And it was like, man, it was like the conversation that we had, the, the you know, the rhetoric that we had created, the dialogue that we had created was was amazing. You know what I'm saying? With combination of your knowledge when it comes to trading, when it comes to AI, when it comes to technology, and then mine when it comes to crypto, it was just like this awesome conversation, man. And that's why I really wanted to get you on the show and uh, kind of give people a little piece of that and, and you know, kind of get them interested and in thinking about other things that may not be talked about as much between individuals in the crypto world. So, you know, I was just thinking like, especially you, because you have a lot of of knowledge and a lot of experience when it comes to the traditional stock market. Like, how do you feel they relate between crypto and the stock market? Do you feel like they correlate well? Do you feel like it's completely different? Like, do you feel like one will impact the other? I think they're going to be two in one. Uh, We just had where the NASDAQ is trying to implement a cryptocurrency exchange within itself. And the steps, you know, the banks used to condemn cryptocurrency and now 85% of them are have a projection to actually go to crypto at some point. 
the way that we do analysis work with supply chains is going to go to uh, what's called a proprietary chain, which is a blockchain technology that's going to be funded by crypto in the exchange of consumerism. The whole distribution of how we move data is going to go into blockchain and, and is valued eventually, I believe, through a cryptocurrency. So the market itself or our world itself is going to change into a blockchain cryptocurrency community, society, global machine. Yep. And we're seeing it day to day as every new company finds a new way to innovate blockchain technology more than just crypto. It was like crypto was the first ranger up and here comes the storm of change. Right. And how is it going to affect something next? Because every time blockchain touches something, it's changing the world probably the way color did to the color tel- or to the black and white television. Yep. It's going to be that dramatic and go that much further. And now we're even starting to incorporate cryptocurrency into even a universal currency base off a of blockchain where yeah. with AI, it can be distributed in a matter of seconds, not to mention the growth of, of AI itself because of blockchain technology. So they're becoming one in the same and, and people are starting to make the connections now of how it's really going to change our world in the next tech revolution right. that we've always been thinking about. Yeah, yeah. No joke, dude. Yeah. To see it come together, like you said, it's like another, it's not like another, uh, another brick on top of the, the internet. And it's really revolutionizing a lot of stuff that we have to do technology wise. So it's like, you get excited. You think about these huge companies, right? That already exist. You think about Amazon, you think about Google, you think about eBay and the ways they can take and utilize blockchain technology and transform things. You know, it's it's awesome. It's really awesome. I'm pretty sure it's going to uh, evolutionize into something beautiful. And actually, and then thinking about that, it, I guess it could also be kind of fucking scary because <laughs> depending on uh, what's going on and how they plan on using blockchain and using like the information they get, like you were saying, like when it comes to the, the AI and stuff, you know, it's like how much more would crypto or would blockchain contribute to the investment of that? And, you know, it's like when you think about certain things, like you had shared with me that the video the other day, the uh, the Google is evil and thinking about how you have the human digital ledgers and stuff like that. Like, could you fucking imagine something like that being implemented on a blockchain level? Like that shit's, that shit's like kind of fucking scary, bro. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the thing of it is, is, and what that's, what's so interesting about crypto is crypto is data and data is how most of the evaluations come for these companies. I mean, look at Facebook, who would have ever thought a company, a multi-billion dollar company would be based off of data or Google, the collection of data or the distribution of data. And now we're starting to see, okay, how do we send that data faster? How do we encrypt it faster? Now we have the blockchain. And then from the blockchain, now we're going to start living in a wireless world. So we now we have the spectrum aspect of it all. And that's kind of how me and you really first got started talking because I was like, I know I live in a world of data. Right. How are those data highways going to be built and off of what platform? And now I'm seeing, wow, we went from car sized data on these small lanes to se- like almost not even semi trucks, trains worth of data right. that are going to be delivered at a high rate of speed. And it's, and it's the world is nothing more than data. Yeah. So that's where the whole, the whole ability of blockchain is really just finding its niche in everything. AI is, is formulated off of data. That is true. That is very true. And- and tying all that back in together, especially when you were talking about spectrum bands, I think a lot of people fail to realize how important that is and how much that contributes with the way technology, especially the Internet operates here in the U.S. It's really anywhere around the world. But if you can, for the, for the average person, right, they may not know about spectrum brands. Can you break that down a little bit for, for the listeners and let them know kind of what that is and, and how that works in relation, say, like Japan compared to the U.S.? Sure. Yeah, no problem. So spectrum bands are one through 12. and for each band, you have a certain amount of data that can be traveled on. So I want you to think about like this. If you're on spectrum one, that's like a one lane road. You know, you can only put so many cars on, it gets congested very easily. Then you have two, three, four, and that's how we got our 3G, 4G, 4G LTE. Now we're moving into 5G. And the interesting part about that is when you add another lane of spectrum going from 4G to 5G, the amount of data you can transfer on that is so significantly increased. Right. Um, a comparison would be a uh, 1G would be when you used to run around the house on a walkie-talkie. You know, you can only go so far. You couldn't be in between too many walls. Uh, you know, just you and your best friend having fun around the house or in the backyard. Right. That's <laughs> 1G. 
4G LTE is now streaming, but we still have a buffer problem because too much data is going out and there's not enough lanes to carry it. So now we're going to move into 5G and add a substantial amount of lanes to that data being able to transfer. The crazy thing about this is, is I've, I've been to Japan. I lived there for, for many years. Yeah. And uh, because they have typhoons in Japan, they've learned to go wireless. They've almost been forced through the environment to go wireless. And because they've gone wireless, they've learned how to utilize these, these bands to send them out the most amount of data at the highest rates because the latency was always a problem. You know, banks don't want to work on latency problems. Right. True. Uh, because then the security becomes an issue. That definitely makes sense. So then what is it like in Japan then with them basically not having wires or, or basically that being the goal with their weather, say, compared to here in the U.S.? Well, I, I would basically say when I when I was there, I was able to real time without the concept of buffering in Japan off of their networks. They were using higher bandwidth, uh, more cellular towers. And when I say cellular towers, I'm talking about towers the size of a briefcase. Um, <laughs> we equivalent them to MIMOs here. Yeah, it was like an integrated network onto itself. Instead of having to globally connect itself, each little area would connect itself and then you would just jump from network to network. Uh, but yeah, when I first came back to the US, I, I yeah. thought my iPhone was broke because it kept <laughs> saying buffering and I had no idea what buffering was. Uh, I, it was like as if you explain dial up to somebody, they're like, what is dial up? Like, I have no <laughs> clue. I'm on. I'm on high speed bandwidth right now. <laughs> Yo, and that's that's hilarious. So it's like we're almost expecting for it to get to a point to where thinking about it, like kids in the future, they're gonna be like, "Yo, what the fuck is buffering?" Like, I don't even like. No, shit pops up yeah. immediately, instantly. Like that's crazy to think that how far we came from back in the day. Like I remember, you know, having to plug the telephone cord into the back of the computer in order to get internet and all of that other bullshit. And you have to wait, you know, you can't be on the phone at the same time unless you have a dedicated line for the internet. And now it's just like, boop, you just got this fucking box. You know what I'm saying? You can get to Wi Fi and it just fucking runs. Like that's, if buffering gets to that point in the US to where there's basically it's non existent, that's going to revolutionize so much shit. It's going to be fucking crazy. Right. And that's, you know, that's because it's expansive. It's, it's, It's very expensive to build out networks like that. You know, in, in Japan, it's only an island. So you have to do, you have to give compensation to scale. They're able to advance themselves because they have a smaller network, which it's less cost burdensome versus the US. I right. mean, we have 50 states, they have one island. So that's where they're able to make the leaps. But if, if I could tell you the difference, the difference between 4G LTE is going to be your 100 megabytes per second now to a thousand megabytes per second when you get on a 5G network. You're going Damn. to be able to process things 10 times faster. The only reason, too, that we don't have 5G right now is because phones, phone developers have not wanting to bite the bullet and put the money into R&D because they don't feel that the market's strong enough. Now, your phone right now, and this is why I believe my phone was my phone is my, my Japanese phone is smarter yeah. or not smarter, but it's more capable. Your iPhone, your Pixel, whatever. There's two transmitters, two receivers. Uh-huh. That's fine. You're only getting 100 megabytes per second. You know, it takes it in, it flips it out, it takes it in, it flips it out. Well, on 5G, you can't take in a thousand megabytes per second on two transmitters and two receivers. It right. just won't happen. It's too, it'll burden the phone down and the processor. Now that Qualcomm has come up with his 365 Dragon and Apple and Samsung have four transmitters, four receivers, even if you do this simple math, you're going to go from 100 megabytes per second to 200 megabytes per second, or Shit. hopefully four to 600 megabytes per second. So if you blink, and you hit buffering maybe twice, three times when it takes about a minute to download a movie, you're talking about you're going to go down to 15 to 20 seconds with no buffer latency wow. to download that movie. And that is, that's what we call, it's going to be called the Internet of Things. Going I back hope. to Japan, exactly, I the Internet of Things. Going back to Japan, they have what's called smart cities. And now we have two smart cities here in America. And these smart cities are hard to explain because it's, it's almost like walking into... I don't know, a movie of the future and then coming back and trying to explain to people. Um, when I when I tell people about my experiences, they can't believe how right. integrated cities can actually become with the IO and the community behind it. Man. Which is all gonna be powered by blockchain. Yeah, see that's gonna that's that shit like that is gonna be beautiful. I can't wait to see stuff like that happen because I mean, just thinking about that, a fucking city that is Wi-Fi capable. 
that doesn't have that latency. I can even imagine walking down a street and not seeing, you know, uh, cords or something like that in, in a sense of everything really being that well connected, that much Wi-Fi. But to have that type of, of, of ability in a city, like I can only imagine how much that would free people up in the sense of give them the ability to do certain things. Like, you know, here in the U.S., right, they'll have certain cities that have like the city free version of Wi-Fi where you're in certain parts of the city. Like, But usually where you go somewhere, that shit is trash. The signal is usually pretty crappy and, you know, you have to be in this really remote area. But when you talk about stuff like that, smart cities, I mean, you can get to the point to where you can put strong signals like that all over the place that could completely revolutionize what somebody is trying to do with their life. Because, I mean, you have people or certain people that literally something that is to damn near being essential, which is affording Internet, they can't afford it. So imagine if a city makes, a, you know, makes Wi-Fi available to everybody, whether you can afford Internet or not, or whether they have special, you know, circumstances of, you know, you have to be in this this particular situation to have it. But, you know, stuff like that, it can really change infrastructure when it comes to the way certain the way certain things in a city operate. So shit like that, you know, that really excites me, bro. Like for real. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, the efficiency that we're going to be seeing is is catastrophic. Um, I just read the other day that um, Sprint teamed up with a a robotics company and now they have a self-driving electric Phillips station. Now imagine wow. this, imagine this, we're on a 5G network, okay? Right. And your, you know, your phone or you're notified by your phone that your car is low on electricity. Well, your car contacts this robot. The robot comes to you, it fills up your car while you're working. It <laughs> uses solar panels so it's clean. It's an electric car. And then you use digital currency to pay for the electricity and you never have to go to a gas station again. Yeah, that's fucking nuts. <laughs> like, that's I crazy. Mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean the, imagine if you have what, what they used to call, uh, well, not they used to, but they have what's called a smart refrigerator. You go to the store, you make an initial purchase of milk. You oh, come, well, yeah. when you make the purchase, you pay for it with, you know, digital currency. So that way the ledger's there. Your AI notices you buy it. You put it in your smart uh, fridge. Your smart fridge basically has weight scales on it. And it can tell from your purchase what every object is because the likelihood of two objects weighing exactly the same. And also it can scan it when you, you know, when you put it in there. Right. So as you consume this milk, your smart fridge will talk to your smart home, will then contact the store to send the milk to you. You'll pay for it with your phone and all you'll have to do is accept the charge. Dude, that's which will be through digital currency. Think about how much more time people will have to do the things that they enjoy because they have AI run by through blockchain digital wow. currency, so they don't have to have to worry about banking anymore. And the efficiency of a of a a five G network that's built on the Internet of Things servicing those people. Yeah, that's fucking. People are about to be lazy as shit. <laughs> yeah. Now, like, that's crazy. That's insane. Like, that's dope, though. Like, when you think about when you take stuff like that and you use it correctly to where it's like, okay, I don't have to spend this extra time putting in work as far as, all right, make a list of the grocery store and know what to buy, blah, blah, blah. Like, you think about taking that, eliminating that task altogether to where you just have to approve the charges. And now you can spend that time productively doing something else, whether it's working out, spending time with your family, whatever, you know, whatever the fuck you want to do. But that's that shit is a, that's amazing. That's the part of technology that I look forward to. The technology that comes along. And the person that has the mindset that rather from hindering them, it fucking frees them. Like, to me, that's the point. Like, that's amazing. It does. It does. And you know what? It's, I, I like the part of it because, you know, being, you know, in the generation that I am, I'm definitely more conservative when it comes to environmental impacts. What I read about this, another thing I read about the smart city, which I loved is when you put a 5G network in a smart city and you let the street lights communicate right. with automatic driving vehicles, you then have a more efficient city because let's say five cars, five self-driving cars come up to a streetlight. Well, if it can talk to that streetlight and that streetlight sees that there's no other cars in oncoming traffic, well, they're going to let those cars keep going and there's not going to be congestion right. and people are going to be safer going to their areas because they're going to have a network of AI that's actually going to be able to dictate where the congestion is, and then how to minimize it as well, then we won't need to build more roads. 
We won't need to chop down more trees. We won't need to put more asphalt because we'll be a more functional commuting society. And we'll also have the free time of not having to worry about driving. So think about that. You get in your car, you tell it where you want to go. It starts driving and the stoplights (laughs) then communicate with each other by talking to each car. Nobody runs into each other. Nobody speeds. Nobody cuts anybody off. Everybody is efficiently placed on a grid system. And it's all ran by a 5G network which in AI would then dictate its efficiency. And now we're not hurting the environment by making more roads. Right. We're not, you know, we're not polluting the environment because we're using electricity, which then mobile electric hotspot or a mobile stations. We're saving on electricity because those lights can actually then turn off when they're not needed because it's an automated system. That, I mean, that's another thing I didn't even think of. I mean, think about the city's utility bills. If they didn't need lights because there was nobody there, Oh, How much more of the true. grid are we protecting now? Yeah, How much no, more of the grid are we protecting? No joke. See, and that's that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's the beautiful aspect of it, man. When you can take technology and use it to make things more es- efficient, especially when you talk about more being more cost effective, like, to me, that's the whole point. So it's like you can, you know, really do a lot of good when you have technology working in that way to try to improve upon things that you know are problems. Like you said, when you just think something as simple as having this technology to know when to turn off a certain section of the city because you know there's no one there just to conserve energy and to save money so you can be pushing that out you know elsewhere because you think about like you take the small amounts of energy or money that's being spent not efficiently and i bet you if you bag all that shit up it's probably ridiculous like it's probably crazy an amount of money or energy that's being used or not used quote unquote in that way so if you can take that you know, pick it with the fine tooth comb and then completely redirect those resources, dude, that would be fucking, that would be huge. Like that would be really yeah, huge. We do see some, we do see some precautionary downside initially with, you know, technology advancing as far as taking more labor jobs. Right. But my flip side to you on that is exactly what we talked about. If you have to pay less in taxes because the city is more efficiently ran and yeah. you pay, you know, you pay less in taxes because, well, they don't have to use as much electricity. You pay less in taxes. Oh, because we don't have to build as many roads. You know, you right. pay less in taxes because we don't have carbon emissions, you know, because we don't, we no longer have to go. I don't, I don't know if it's where you are, but here we have to have emissions testing. If we don't have to pay for all those things, all that extra taxation then goes into our education system. And now our workforce that used to be laborers are technicians. They are basically the 21st century trade union of the industrial revolution. Instead of having carpenters, we'll have um, 5G electric or 5G wireless electricians that are installing modems, you know, instead of having plumbers, we're going to be having guys that know how to do band analysts where you actually can collaborate how much data needs to go in each band. So it's not like we're getting rid of our labor force. We are just giving people the real tools that they need to actually have a job in the future instead of telling people, oh, you know, keep going to college and keep learning the same stuff during the Russia revolution. Right. You know, it, it, and we, we actually have killed our labor unions. And that's why we have zero production here in America. But with the national project, this would be the same as when we built the highways, you know, the interstates. Right. This would put more Americans back to work faster with greater skill sets that are going to carry them on way, you know, way beyond their days. That's true. Now, let me play devil's advocate for a second. Now, right now, you you say all of that. Now, all of that, what you said sounds really good. Now, if it's done correctly with the government, it's like, OK, so we have all of this awesome technology. It's making things more efficient. We can redirect money, uh, specifically, as you said, taxes to do things that are more beneficial for our society. Say, like you said, education. Now. In your honest opinion, do you really do you like do you really believe that's going to happen? Part of me like really wants that to happen and I hope that happens, but part of me thinks like what if the government comes up with this, you know, new ridiculous fund, you know, to fund whatever, whether I mean no matter what it is, and it it things still stay the same when it comes to like things like our education system. Do you feel like that will happen that may happen? Are things going to really get more efficient or is it just does it just sound good and we hope that it does? Well, you know, I mean, we always want the best for our society. I think we are going to have a period of turmoil where people are going to have to readjust like we do. Um, We might even have a bubble. I mean, dot com was pretty bad. You know, when the Internet came out, everybody and their brother thought they were dot com. You know, the next Yahoo, Google, you know, all all of the best search engines that actually survived. But they weren't. 
So we are anticipating a bubble with new technology, but just like the internet was then, it still perpetuated society. We think more positive than it did negative. It's just going to take people absorbing that to actually get the right mindset of how to efficiently use it. Because when we first created the internet, we really didn't, I mean, not we, you know, not the idea, but when the internet was first <laughs> created, I mean, you would ask somebody, well, what are you going to use it for? Everybody was baffled. And we think with this new technology, everybody's going to say, well, what are you going to use it for? And when you never knew you could use it, you never gave it a purpose. So now it's going to be sifting through and there's going to be some trials and tribulations right. you know, of what to positively use it for and what to, you know, what negatively it might impact. But overall, I see, I see a, a capitalist market really taking hold of this. And uh, I think that the, the men and women that have already been the forefront of technology, you know, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, I think even Warren Buffett is is on on the board with this one. You can't quote me on him exactly, right. but they have actually created organizations of open source. That's crazy. Um, Future of Life is you know it's it's a hundred million dollar plus company, and their job is to sustain open source technology, open source blockchain technology. Right. So I, I think that the people that have been innovative, they've learned from their mistakes and how they've seen their technology used in the greater good, but also in the not so positive realm. And they're taking it more on themselves to implement roadblocks for people to go down that route again. And because they want to be remembered for their technology, they don't want to be the guy that, you know, destroyed the world or helped destroy the world. So there, there's a lot of positive people that are very wealthy that are making sure uh, monopolized closed sectors don't overtake it. And one of those, as we always know, is, is the government. So yeah, that's, that's, true. that's his biggest fear. That makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense on a lot of things. So, yeah, I'm definitely hopeful and hope that um, everybody can benefit positively from the direction that we're going in with technology when it comes to spectrum bands, when it comes to blockchain. I completely agree with you. We're, we're seeing handheld devices come out at in the beginning Q1 of 2019. What's really going to blow people's minds. And, and, you know, it's kind of it's kind of, you know, kind of in the back mind, in the back of the mind, because you said instant gratification of Americans compared to the world. But the 2020 Japanese Tokyo Olympics yeah. are going to be launched on a completely 5G network. So you're going to talk about streaming oh, the shit. Olympics on a 5G net network with no latency to the <laughs> world. Man. That's why I think people are really going to get it. When you see no wires laying around, where you see no hub stations that have, you know, coils and, and power sources and all that stuff, just, you know, riding into them. I think that's when people are really going to get it. But, you know, you, like you said, Lane, it's really, it's really impressive because how you say, you know, as, as investors, it's all about the, or as Americans, it's all about instant gratification. We're seeing that as investors. Right. And that's why I'm so glad I ran into you because if I had never ran into you and, uh, you know, I, I have another good friend, Scott Harrison. He's been following the Fed close for me yeah. um, as far as how the Fed has been viewing cryptocurrency. I would have never realized how effective cryptocurrency is or what blockchain was until I had spoken with him and learned about the Fed coin, yeah. how the Fed, you know, they, they're they all, you know, oh, crypto, we don't like it, whatever, but yet they create their own coin. And then you seeing how crypto can be used or blockchain can be used for more than crypto. You know, right. people don't really talk about that until I was talking to you. There's other applications of it. Yes, it's a good core, but there's so many other things you can do with it. Right. And I think if people can get out of that instant gratification and realize technology is coming together in different points. And when it synergizes completely, I believe it's going to be more than the internet because you have the internet of things, you have smart cities, you have crypto, you have right. blockchain, you have the spectrum, which it's all going to run on. You're going to have a powerhouse of technology coming down at you at one time. It's just not going to be one thing. I totally agree, man. And it was funny because like you said, when I really, because obviously just like everybody else, when I first got into crypto, bro, it was about money. <laughs> like period. It was about money. I was like, I related it to the stock market. I'm like, okay, I can make money doing this. I wasn't even aware of the blockchain portion. It was just a crypto. So when I found out about the blockchain, I was like, oh shit, like this, this is what it is. This is where it's at. This is why this is amazing. So it's like, when you really start to think about that, that's the part, at least for me, that's what, that's what, that was my tipping point. That's what pushed me over the edge. That's what got me deeper into the rabbit hole of this whole blockchain and cryptocurrency thing. And I think about how beautiful of an end result that can be if it's pushed the right way. Like you said, like one thing that has changed since I've been in crypto until now 
was my idea and my ideology when it came to uh, regulation. Like I, I, in the beginning, I was like, fuck regulation. It sucks. It's horrible. It's going to kill crypto. Then I really started to think about it. I'm like, in any market, right? You think about it. The thing that helps anything thrive is having options. When you have options, that opens up you know, business for really everybody. It's just like when you drive down the street and very rarely do you ever see a CVS or a Walgreens just completely by itself. You usually see them next to each other the same way you see, you know, fast food restaurants all next to each other is because they give that idea of options. People like to choose. So when I really started thinking about it from that aspect, I was like, you know what? Regulation wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, Overregulation is, of course, right? Too much of anything is bad for you. But with just regulation in general, I was like, that will actually pull in a whole new level, a whole new number of individuals in the crypto that probably or may have never got into it if it didn't exist in that foreign way, you know, a way anyway. So I was like, fuck it. You know what I'm saying? As long as I have the option to operate non-regulated if I want to, fuck it, let, let it come in, let it come into the market. And then people will choose what they want to choose. People will make their options. And I can guarantee you, especially with blockchain, if the option doesn't exist, somebody will end up creating that shit. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. And I mean, I mean, on the social aspect, I mean, think how many jobs come from regulation and we're not even talking, I'm not even talking about federal regulation. You know, I'm talking about people that just commonly watch ledgers, commonly watch network streams, commonly watch the internet, you know, or there are different databases in their servers, you know, just for malicious hard, hard you know, hard, hardware or malware or malicious uh, individuals. So it's that not everybody's meant to be an innovator. Right. You know, I, I used to always think, oh, you know, everybody should be out there and be a day trader. Everybody should go out there and do a hedge fund. Everybody should, you know, right. do market analysis. And I realized <laughs> that it's because you have, like you said, the innovator, then the regulator, it's a seesaw effect and it keeps them both balanced. That right. way the innovator doesn't go too far and, you know, create a Frankenstein, but then yeah. the regulator doesn't stop innovation and we go stagnant. So I, I definitely agree with you. It, it needs to be a joint venture. And you know what, what's really funny about that is how many innovators were pushed because of regulators. How non-stagnant does somebody get when you tell them that they can't? As much as I don't like regulation myself, it spurs innovation. So it does have its place in the market and in our society. And that's, I think, why our society is has done what's done, because everybody's always said, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. Well, why? Why not? Why can't I? Right. You know, and then I I go and I I do it and I I I become better for it because I understand it more thoroughly. And now I can either fix a deficiency or I I've created something new and and it's something that needs to be looked at and and the same process going on and on and on. Right. Yeah. And that's true in my mind at least. I feel like I'm getting to a point to where I almost look forward to some sort of regulation because the one thing I hear all the time is oh crypto. That's not real. You know, that's not backed by anything. Nobody believes that really works. You know, like what what gives it value? It's it's the same shit that gives the USD value. So I think (laughs) with uh, when it comes to things like regulation, I feel like that will help those people legitimize what it is. And it's like, okay, now you were saying before, right? Like, oh, this isn't this isn't real. Why? Because the government didn't back it. They didn't say it was okay. But like you said, if it gets to a point to where FedCoin drops, everybody knows about it, and everybody knows it exists. Well, then what the fuck are you gonna say then? You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like, yeah. Like it's, exactly. it really it really is gonna legitimize the argument. So I'm like, shit, fuck it. Let it you know, let it happen. Let it come. Let it come. I'm not. I feel like naturally that because of the the opportunities that blockchain and crypto present. We're going to have, like you said, we're going to have bubbles and shit like that. I'm pretty sure it comes with anything great like this. But I feel like eventually that there will be this nice middle ground that's met. And then, like you said, it'll be a seesaw. It'll be kind of this 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 consistent back and forth thing. And that's what I look forward to. Once we get over this, what I would call the Internet hump, that same hump the Internet fucking went through where everybody was like either like this is the best shit ever or the people that was like, this is fucking trash and it's not going to be around here in like five years. Once we get over that and then we see shit level out, that's going to be the moment of I feel like of clarity for a lot of people. And that's what I look forward to. So that's the part that I'm just like, you know, hurry the fuck up. You know, that's the part that I'm being impatient about because I really do want to I want to get there because I think that's going to be a beautiful place for a lot of people because I believe it's going to open up opportunity to a lot of people, man. And it's going to be dope. And actually thinking about something you just said, too, 
something that I do want to talk about is the other side of that, the Frankenstein side of that. Like you said, I think about certain things like companies like Google and like Facebook, bro, they have access to a lot of fucking information of ours, like a lot of shit, a lot of data, like that shit where you, where you go on the internet and based on the browser you're in, you will see ads pop up related to what you just searched or in relation to what you just searched. Like, how much more accurate could that be with the combination of both blockchain for the ledger aspect and then like AI for the smart aspect of being able to calculate, okay, what might this person be interested in seeing an ad for based on this other shit that they've clicked? I feel like that that could potentially go down a really dark fucking road <laughs> if uh, if the wrong people get a hold of that or if, you know, the conspiracy shit starts to kind of come out like, what do you what do you think about that? Like, how do you do you feel like uh, is, is Google evil? Is it is Google evil? You think they're going to end up trying to use that shit against us and the government's going to try to use that against us more so to control us? It kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier about regulation. This is when I am a very big advocate uh, for regulation, stricter regulation on, on the idea of people's data. There's an AI that I, I just read about actually the other day. It basically says that when you enter a hospital It can tell if you are going to die or the probability of you dying in 24 hours. And it's it's in the higher 90 percentile. And what it does is it takes all of your data. It it pulls all your national data. I mean, national, I mean, blood tests, urine tests. It it looks at your genetics. It looks at your family's history. And it basically does an analysis and gives an outcome of what's going to happen with you with the symptoms that you have now. Now, isn't a great thing. Yes, that's a great thing. And no, that's not a great thing. And I'll tell you why. I saw another AI about optometry. Now they took a hundred optometrists and they they looked in a person's eye and they all gave about a 50-50 recommendation of what it was. Then two hours later, they came in and they looked at the same eye. Now, mind you, they didn't know it was the same eye. And only a quarter of them actually gave their original prediction of what it was. Okay. They basically then called it something else. So now you have doctors that are not maliciously, but because in human nature are giving different opinions right. than they previously did. So it, bring, it brings more human error into it. They use an AI, optometrist robot. It was effective about 96 to 98% of the time, and it had a consistency rating of 100%. In some aspects, that robot was better than those hundred doctors because it didn't have human error. It was consistent. But in other cases, yes, the the AI can misdiagnose somebody because of a general difference. You know, not every person is going to be the same where they can statistically fall into a category and be calculated. Uh, That's kind of how the AI does when you go into the hospital. It calculates you statistically. With optometry, AI, it kind of goes off of a off of a bank. So it has less probability of fault. So that those are the kind of the, the two counter oppositions I, I've seen there is when should AI take control and when AI shouldn't take control. And that goes with who's allowed to access the data. Right. Yeah. See, and that's going to be the interesting part. And I think that's where blockchain is going to play a huge part because like I think about obviously, so back what I was doing before, you know, before I just recently retired is that I was working in a medical field. I was an EMR specialist. So I worked specifically with Epic. So I would go into these hospitals, you know, whether I'm working with family doctors, family practice doctors, or, you know, surgeons and uh, anesthesiologists, stuff like that. And then I would teach them how to use the EMR, the electronic medical record system that records all of the data that they enter on the patient. So obviously we're talking about diagnoses you know, medications, past medical history, family medical history, you know, all of this shit, social social medical history. And I think about what you just said when it comes to the AI. And then you talk about crypto or you talk about blockchain when it comes to the ledger aspect of that. And like that, like seeing all of that come together and work together is going to be interesting as fuck <laughs> because it's already getting pushed in that direction. Like it's especially with just the, the home front of everything medically being pushed to be electronic and the idea of being, you know, doing paper charting is damn near going to be obsolete probably after a certain amount of time, unless you're just this really small ass mom and pop type medical facility, you know, or, or doctor's office. But it's like everybody's doing electronic shit. So that's just fueling 
you know, it, it's going to make the shift even easier if they, you know, when they do implement, if they do implement like the AI you were talking about on a larger scale into where it becomes almost like a fucking standard. And then, like you said, I feel like that it could be healthy in the, in the fact of knowing one, when is AI better to use than a human and making sure that that's balanced correctly. And then two, the probably the even more important side of it is who in the hell is going to be looking at this data? Who has access to this data? And I feel like that's going to be the thing where conspiracies come into play and people are going to be like, well, can we all see it? Can we all just, you know, go on to the block explorer and look at people? Like, obviously, that's that's not going to happen with medical shit. But when you think about that, you know, it is going to get interesting because who is going to reign supreme over who has access? Who's going to even call the shots? Who's going to say who is going to have access to that data or not? That's going to be important. And that's what I think about when I think about shit like Google and Facebook, when they start collecting data on that and they have it locked into blockchain to a point to where you can't just change it and manipulate it. Who's going to have access to that? Are we going to have access to our own fucking data? You know, can we can we look at our own shit? You know, we don't now. We don't now. The way Facebook works now, they have all of our shit. and We don't determine what we do with it. They can send that shit out and make a bunch of money off of that shit. We don't get a piece of it at all. And then that's, uh, you know, another thing of crypto, you have projects like that that are coming out that are trying to take that part of technology and give that power back to the consumer. So you have certain projects that are creating, trying to create social communities to where it's like, all right, well, all your shit that's on here, all your information, we're going to set it up to where you can figure out who you want to sell it to. And then you, you get a piece of it. And I'm like, shit like that is dope. I completely agree with you on that one. I think as long as we can keep a clean, open market, when we see a defect, or when we see a negative outcome, we have the ability to step up and do it. Me personally, I'm not a big Facebook fan. I've, I've trended that, you know, they've been losing subscribers consistently and they're going to keep losing subscribers. That's yeah. because people lost faith. You know, that's what, you know, that's what's great about blockchain. It's all about trust. When Facebook lost people's trust, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, you know, all those other companies, they were created and stepped up and reinforced the trust that people had lost with Facebook and and the same with digital currency. I mean, when, you know, when Bitcoin had its recent pullback of almost 70%, I saw a lot of coins that sustained the, what I would call bubble of Bitcoin. Right. And they actually right. grew because they offered better trust in their products. And because that open market was available, they did well and they survived and they're still maintaining their highs. As far as Google goes, Google's a little bit different of a beast because of how large it's grown and how much it has acquired. I'd be very interested to see in the future how, if any, it's going to be able to maintain an open market as it claims it has, but lose profitability in in allowing that to happen to itself. Because no no company wants to be self defeating by by allowing the competition to outpace them with the size of Google. I am weary about what exactly competition would have to look like or the size of the company to be competitive against Google would have to look like or the government or what kind of steps would actually have to be taken for Google to actually have competition uh, once again because of how large it has become. Because like you said, it's all about data. It's all going to be data. And I believe Google should be regulated like a utility at this point. Why not? (laughs) I mean, we regulate our water. We regulate our electricity. We regulate most of our fuel. Why not regulate who allows the outcome and income of data? I, I personally think Google should be regulated as if it was a utility because at this point it pretty much is. Yeah. And you know what? That's interesting. I've never heard anybody say that <laughs> ever, but that is a good point. Like that is really a good point. It's like one of those essential things almost, you know, one of those things that a lot of companies probably wouldn't really be able to operate with, or at least not as officially without. So you think about things like water, electricity and stuff like that. Data really is falling into that same fucking category, especially the way it's being built into the infrastructure of our internet and the, and the way a lot of companies do marketing, you know, stuff like that. Like data is fucking important. And I think that is something that should come with some sort of regulation because it's like, you know, in a perfect world, right? Ah, uh, you know, everybody's going to do the right thing. Yeah, fucking right. Yeah, that's, you know, very seldomly right. does that happen when you talk about an entity as large as Google that has as much power as Google based on the monetary power they have, the data-driven power they have. Like, they're a fucking beast. Like, they are a fucking beast, like, period. 
So it's like, okay, who's regulating that? You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't want to get Google. We don't want Google to get to the point of the fucking Fed Reserve to where it's like, oh, they no, they just never been audited ever. And we're just like, everybody's just like, just not saying shit. Like, nah, somebody should probably check and make sure they're not doing some crazy ass shit with our information. I mean, I mean, let's, well, let's look at the option. Let's say Google, let's say Google didn't even maliciously do it, but accidentally had a problem, had to shut down. How many people would know how to access the web? How many people would then had to know how to access information? True. I mean, the only other, the only other option we have, I believe in my, I'm not even sure if it's still around. Think about it, is what Internet Explorer? Is that even <laughs> such a thing? Does it even <laughs> offer the capability? I mean, does it even have, I mean, but, but let's be honest. If Google right. was taken off the face of earth tomorrow, let's say an asteroid just, you know, hit all the servers at the same time and Google was gone. Is <laughs> there a backup network to sustain the internet of life? That's and we live on the internet of life. Right. I mean, think about it. If Google was gone, how are we going to find information? We don't publish books anymore. We don't actually have warehouses full of goods anymore. We order them and then they're made and then they're sent to us. Yeah. So if we can't access them, that at that point, like you said, it becomes a, a lifeline of a utility. It is. And, and I think about that. Like, you know, you think about things where they talk about like, oh, you know, if all of the power in the city gets shut down, then people are going to go into panic. You push it even further. It's like, fuck that. Say we have power. What if just internet goes down? I could, it's getting to the point to where it's like, oh shit, I think people really would like lightweight go into a fucking panic. They would be like, yo, what the, I can't watch Netflix and YouTube and fucking Facebook. Like motherfuckers wouldn't know what, they wouldn't have nothing to do. Like they would be confused. It would be like rewinded time back to like the fucking seventies or some shit. Online banking would crash online. I mean, no more online purchasing. I mean, the, the, that's why we're adopting the internet of things is we're trying to put everything on the internet, yeah. but with putting everything on the internet and, and, and having 5g be the highway for data to, to travel on, just like our roads, everybody complains about them. They're shitty. They need to be maintained. They need to be structured and they need to be focused on constantly because they're always being worn down. I don't feel like Google being the utility of the internet is ever looked upon as far as well is it going to get fixed? Is it going to be maintained? How is it going to address these problems? And then how is it going to serve society? Because just because they're ethically now, what happens if later on they're not ethically? Who's going to take what's their given proprietary rights? Yeah, that's true. Yep. So, yeah, it's just about to get interesting, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm very curious to see how things are going to change, evolve, what, what things pretty much transpire from the combination of spectrum, AI, and fucking blockchain. Like that shit, I think it's going to be massive, bro. Like I, I really think it is. And I think it's going to push things forward in a way that most people didn't fucking expect. And I think it's going to be for like that for two reasons. One, most people don't actually fucking research and go outside of the US and really try to figure out shit that's going on in the world. So most people don't even know shit like, you know, cities in Japan, smart cities even fucking exist. On top of that, I think that people were just kind of in this, comfortable state so you know just like when they talk about you know the average person doesn't know how our fucking financial system works here they don't know economics you know and i feel like technology is kind of starting to get to that point it's starting to get to the point to where the average person doesn't really know what's going on in the technology realm and the direction we're headed in and i think that's why it's going to catch a lot of people off guard so it's like when you sit down and you talk to the average person you tell them like yo could you imagine a city that was completely smart and then it would calculate everything for you they'd be like what the fuck? Like that's some Futurama type shit. You know, that's like some shit that's, that was, you know, on a movie, you know, on a fucking Twilight Zone, you know, back in the day. And they're like, what? Like, nah, that's never going to happen. But it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really getting to that point. It's really coming, coming to that point. On that point, I have, you know, two, I always, I think about this a lot, some, or a lot. Sometimes I even have sleepless nights thinking about it. It's going to go two ways. And you're right. Other people are going to have more free time Yep. And still be plugged in even more to the matrix of the internet of things or the founders that are creating this technology are going to be, like you said, trying to free people's time. That way they go back to doing what we were supposed to do. And that's what we love. Yep. You know, we have all this automation, which gives us all this free time. I don't know if you've heard this before, but it's called the universal income. The idea is to have blockchain pay everybody an income from the different governments because there's not enough jobs. But because we're so innovative and we're so efficient, 
those extra taxes go back to the people and then they get to actually do things that they want to do. And that's where that's where a lot of the bright funds come from. If people don't have to go to work and they're able to do what they're truly passionate about, society will grow as individuals and they'll reconnect with each other. And people see that. People see how technology has made people overly connected but disconnected. Right. And so now they're hoping that people will come back and truly connect. Will yeah. they? I, you know, half the time I say yes, half the time I say no, but it's yeah. going to be definitely interesting to see how we change as a society and we will change in one way or the other. It's just going to be our choice if it's positive or negative. Facts. Yep. Yep. I'm ready. I'm ready. 20, 2025, 2030. I want to see that. Damn. I wish I could fucking time travel. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, yeah, I guess we'll figure that out, man. We'll see it in the years to come, bro. I'm, I'm definitely interested, man. Nate, bro. Thanks. <laughs> for hopping on the on the podcast, bro. This shit was dope. I didn't even realize that much time went by that quick, bro. But that's why I love when we have conversations, man. It's always intriguing to me. And that's always good information. That's why I feel like I wanted to create this podcast, this episode in particular, to really share our conversations with the world, man. So people can see what's going on and people can get, you know, get people interested. Like, yo, look up Google Spectrum Bands, Google AI, Google DeepMind, yeah. Google, Google human digital ledgers. Like, look this shit up. You know, this is this is yeah. really happening. You know, this isn't an idea anymore. Like, this shit is actually taking place, bro. So, like I said, man, again, thank you, man, for coming on to the show. I highly appreciate it. Dude, we're going to have to get you on here again. Facts. Oh, yeah, no problem, man. I mean, I say, I mean, I say maybe every two years we do a follow up and see how how right we were, or how wrong we were. And, you know, maybe where it's going, kind of create our own uh, our own little timeline of the change of things. I have a great time talk. I love uh, different shows and podcasts and, you know, just figuring out how people view it, figure out how everybody's technology is going to work into it. Because right. it's going to be something amazing. And uh, like I said, we should definitely do a follow up show and see. You know, maybe even, yeah, just see how right we were or what, what society chose because it's going to okay. happen. But yeah, high frequency spectrum band, 5G, blockchain and, and, and digital or uh, cryptocurrency is going to be huge. Yep. And then um, the AI behind all of that's going to run it all. It, that's going to be the, the, the next investment of the next 25 to 30 years. So we'll see where it goes and uh, how it all plays out in every market. There it is. There y'all here have it, man. Yeah, I think that's good, man. A year, every year, every two years, yeah, let's reevaluate, bro. Let's see how how right or wrong we were. I'm I'm, I'm with it, man. So yeah, everybody, that's Nate Thomas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, thank you so much, man. And uh, like I said, may, maybe in 2025 we'll have our AI bots doing the the banter force, and they can they can reevaluate what we said and maybe give <laughs> an insight to it. A little bit of AI on there. Oh man, that's awesomely scary. But I'm I'm with it. I'm with it. I'm with it to see where it goes, bro. <laughs> We'd like to thank everyone for your support here at the Bullpen Podcast all season long and look forward to having you at the next episode. We'd also like to give a special thanks to the team behind the scenes that make this show possible. Today's show notes can be found on our website at thebullpenpodcast.io forward slash post show stats. Also, don't forget to like and retweet us at one bullpen podcast. That's the number one bullpen podcast. And to watch Lyndon do some exciting and probably some weird things too, tune into the Snapchat at the Crypto Bully. That's at the Crypto Bully. It's been a pleasure, and see you at the next show. Good night, everyone.